Galatians chapter 5, we'll be reading verses 16 through 18. I'd like to welcome you here and the ones that listen on the internet. We're thankful, as I said earlier, for this day of grace. We're thankful for this opportunity that we can meet. And we just rejoice based on who we are in Christ. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Father, we do thank you for your grace, your love to us. We're thankful for each saint here. We're thankful for the ones who listen on the internet. And I pray that today will be an edifying time for all of us. I pray that we'll just rejoice based on who we are in Christ. For we ask in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Looking at these verses here, if you'll look in Galatians 5, 16, you can refer back to Romans 6 for that verse. You look in Galatians 5, 17, you can go to Romans 7. And you go to Romans or Galatians 5, 18, you can go back to Romans chapter 8. So that will help you doing your Bible study. What I'd like to teach on today, the theme of the lesson, the meaning of being led of the Spirit. The meaning of it. You know, we talk, we read the verses here, and it says there in verse 18, if you be led of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Verse 16, walk in the Spirit. So the meaning of being led of the Spirit. And many people today, and you think about this, have many different ideas about walk and led. Walk in the Spirit, led of the Spirit. You hear all kinds of ideas all kind of thoughts, all kind of reasonings, and that, that type of thing. But Romans 5, 18, led of the Spirit, and uh, Romans, when you go to Romans 8, 14, if we won't right now, we will. It talks about led by the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 8, but if you be led of the Spirit. And this is not decision making based on feelings. And a lot, a, a lot of people will make their decisions based on how they feel and then they'll say, well, I'm led of the Spirit to do that. Or they'll base it on circumstances. And you never base things on circumstances. There's all kinds. Of, the CNS gangs out there, we face circumstances and situations every day in our lives. And you don't base that on, well, that's the will of the Lord that that happened to me and this and that. But you'll hear people talk that way and what we ought to ask ourselves, does God work in believers today? And the answer is yes. He does work in us. Well, how does He work in us today? He's not working in the circumstances. He's not working in the situations and all that. But how does God work today? So turn your right to Philippians chapter 2. Ephesians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians 2. And look at verse 13. Does God work in believers today? Yes, He does. Well, how does He work today? Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you, notice that, both the will and the do of His good pleasure. God works in you. And you, if you go back to the left, Ephesians 3, 16, Ephesians 3, 16, uh, God works in us. And Ephesians 3.16, notice it says, in Ephesians 3.16, For He, that's the Father, would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. How am I strengthened? I'm strengthened in my inner man because God works in me. God's Word working in us today with the Holy Spirit teaching us. And as you think about that, God has revealed His will to us in His Word. Uh, you know, that leads to this question. God's revealed His will to us through His Word. Well, what are we to do today? We're to obey His Word. And, and some folks say, well, I don't know if I like the word obey. Well, turn to Galatians chapter 5 and look what Paul told the Galatians. Galatians chapter 5 about obey. In Galatians chapter 5, and look at verse 7. Galatians 5, 7. 
He did run well. Talking about the Galatian believers. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You know, it's my responsibility as a believer to obey the truth, just like yours. It was those Galatians' responsibility to obey the truth. Saying that, go back to Romans 8 now. We'll turn to that. Romans 8, 14. We're talking about walking the Spirit. We're talking about led by the Spirit. Well, look what Romans 8, 14 says. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit, notice that of God, they are the sons of God. Now, when you read led by the Spirit here, this verse is not justification. Do you remember, how do you, how do you get justification? You get justification when you believe the cross work of Jesus Christ, that Christ died for our sins, and that He was buried, and He rose again the third day. And when you believe the gospel, that's when you're saved, and that's when you're justified. That's justification. You have to remember here, this is the 8th chapter of Romans, and reading the first five chapters of Romans, your justification is already settled. If you're, if you're saved, that's the first five chapters of Romans, it tells you about your justification. You're declared righteous. You're saved. You have eternal life by believing the gospel. And that's why I say it's so important to ask yourself today, if I die right now, where will I spend eternity? And the answer should be, I'll spend it with the Lord in heaven. Well, how do you get that? You get that by believing what the Lord Jesus Christ did, that He died on the cross, He was buried, He was raised again. He died for my sins. And when the moment you believe that, that's when you're saved. That's, that's salvation. And there shouldn't be anybody here today that, uh, that really doubts their salvation. As far as adults go, we know, we should know that salvation is based on the death, burial, and resurrection. It's a gift. It's a, it's, we're saved by grace. So Romans chapters 1 through 5 would settle the justification. So Paul gets to Romans 8 here. When you read Romans 8, 14, this is not about justification. But what is Romans 8, 14 taught, talking about? Paul's talking about sonship, about adults. And he's talking about their walk as believers is what he's getting at in Romans 8, 14 there. When he talks about verse 14, for as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And led by the Spirit, so what's that mean? When you're led by the Spirit of God, you take the Word of God, uh, you're, a, you're adults, you're sons of God, you're walking in the Spirit, you're putting the Word of God in you, right and dividing, uh, and you're led by the Spirit of God, we get out of the way ourselves and we let the Holy Spirit lead us through the Word, the word of God. It's what we do. So, here's the thing about all of us. We have a fight going on. If you're saved today, you've got a fight going on. Now, if you're not saved, there's no fight internally. But I've got one every day. And, and one day you're saved, have one too. There's a fight constantly going on in my inner man. And look in Galatians chapter 5, you'll say, well, why is that? You're saved. We shouldn't have any fights or going on inside of us. Well, you look in Galatians 5 and verse 17. Here's, here's what I'm faced with as a believer. Here's what you're faced with in Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh, that's your body, lusteth, that's that old sin nature too, lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the thing that you would. You remember I said last week, make up a man. You're made up of spirit, soul, and body. Well, what's the one in the middle? Soul. So what do you got on the left side? You got the spirit. You got on the right side, you got your body. And there's just a fight going on. <clears throat> constant with the two. So, you think about what are they fighting over? What's the spirit and, and flesh fighting over? It's fighting over my soul. It's fighting over the, the old flesh says, I'm going to tell the old soul what's, what he's going to do. The spirit says, no, I'm going to. So there's a battle. You've got a battle every, every day. 
Uh, so what should our soul be doing? Since I've got, my soul's got a battle. I mean, you think about this. You think about your, your spirit and you think about the soul and then you've got the body. Well, like I said, the body has emotion. The body wants to tell the spirit and soul what to do. The spirit wants to tell the body what to do as well. So there's a conflict there. And it goes back and forth. So what should I do? You know, I'm, I'll speak for myself. The real Frank is my soul. That's who I am. That, and you think about, what should I do? Should I choose the spirit or the body? Well, there's no doubt. I choose the spirit all day long. Every day. And, and how would I defeat that flesh, that body? I would defeat it by reading the Word of God, studying the Word, building up the doctrine into me rightly divided. You build up sound doctrine in you. That's what so many people don't realize uh, about your soul. You're building a house in your soul. And that house has got, I'll draw a little house here, and that's a house of doctrine. Romans is that foundation. Ephesians is a framework. First, second Thessalonians is a roof on it. And all of you have heard that many times. But I'm building that up in my soul. And if I build that up in my soul, then my spirit and soul is going to tell the body, hey, you're going to drive me around today. This is what you're going to do today. But if I don't do that, the old body says, I've got you. So I'm going to drive us spirit and soul around that they're going to do what I want, want them to do. And it's all emotions. You think about that as well as it goes uh, with emotion, the emotion part. And when you build up sound doctrine in you, like that house, what's that going to produce? Maturity. And that's where Romans 8, we read 14 there comes in. We'll go back to that later. So we think about maturity. Think about the meaning of being led of the Spirit. And you think about maturity when you think on that line. Go to Romans 12. Here's an example. Romans 12, 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul was given the doctrine in the first nine chapters, uh, first eight chapters of Romans. And in Romans 9, 10, 11, he talked about Israel. Now in Romans 12 through 16, you take the doctrine, you've learned the first eight chapters of Romans, you apply that in the details of your life in Romans 12 through 16. That's how you look at that book. So look, we're, we're going to apply the doctrine in the details of our life in Romans 12, 1. starts out, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. No, sir, I beseech you. That's, that's the grace part of it. Issue of, son, of a son's response. I beseech you, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that ye, notice that, that ye do what? Present your bodies. That's an act of personal choosing. When you present your bodies, that's a personal choosing there. And that's where the, the doctrine comes in. We should have that foundation. The first eight chapters of Romans, that doctrine should be in our inner man, and by the time we get to Romans 12, we're ready to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable servant. We know that that body is a vehicle. We know also that there's a war going on between the spirit and the flesh, the body. We understand that now. And so that's why an act of personal choosing, I personally choose to build that house in me and let that body, let that spirit, soul drive that body around and tell it what to do. I, I do it because of His goodness to me. You know, you think about God's goodness to us. He sent His Son and died on Calvary's cross for us. He saves us by grace. He seals us with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And you think about God's goodness to, to us and that's why I don't act out of legalism. I'm not acting because somebody's trying to tell me you're going to have to do this. 
And I don't act that way. I act based on my choosing. I choose to build that house in my inner man. I choose to get up. I choose to get up early. I choose to stay up late to put the doctrine in my soul. That's my choosing. Uh, and I, Because I see that all that God's done for me. That, what that does, that creates gratitude and love in my heart. That's mature. And a mature understanding in a walk. That's why I put the meaning of being led of the Spirit. We need a mature understanding as we, as we walk. And I, we want to look at about five things today along this line about maturity. A mere, a, a mature understanding in walk. And we'll look at these things about a mature walk and led of the Spirit. Number one, and I just chose these. The first one I'm going to look at is marriage. Now, there's not many chapters about marriage, even in Romans through Philemon. But you just think off the top of your head, what chapter would you go to to talk about marriage? And I chose 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And that, that is a marriage chapter. And the Corinthians were asking Paul questions about marriage. And we're not going to go into all of this, but I am going to go down to chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 39. And I'm not going to try to explain the whole verse, but that last phrase in that verse, I'll read the, I'll read the verse to you. 1 Corinthians 7, 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is loose. She is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the, in the Lord. And there's a lot of reference back to Romans 7 in that. But you think about only in the Lord. And that's, you think about a marriage, what's the will of God in a marriage? Well, He tells you there, only in the Lord. You know, if I was going out to say I'm single, and I'm going out to find a mate, a wife, it should be only in the Lord. Now that, that's the right way to do it. Well, let me say this to you. I'm just, I use this for a lady. What if a lady has sound doctrine in her soul? She's saved. She's got that house of doctrine in her soul. She's single, and she wants to marry, and she wants sound doctrine in a, in a husband that she chooses. She understands Oh, you know, I can marry only in the Lord. I want somebody to save, first of all. But she goes further and says, I want some, a man that's not only saved, but he's come to the knowledge of the truth. He's got sound doctrine in him. Well, that eliminates a lot. You know that. Mm. So, uh, she doesn't have as many to pick from. And that's, that's what I'm saying about a mature person. A mature person, you think about this, you're building the doctrine up in your inner man. You understand marriage is only in the Lord. You understand it. I can marry, but I want to marry somebody that's saved. That's, that's the first step. And, but this, I just take another step. This lady said, well, I want a man that's not only saved, but he's, he, he's, he's come to the knowledge of the truth. He's mature too. And like I said, that, that reduces the number. The count goes way down to find somebody like that. And you know that. that that's, I think about, you know, back when we married, I'd just been saved less than a year. Did I know anything? I didn't know anything. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, if somebody told me all this, I wouldn't have had a clue what they were saying. Didn't know. Babe in Christ. Connie was married, or not Connie was married, she married me, but. Connie didn't know either. She was saved. So here you go. You know, not knowing. But I can tell you this. If you've got a willing mind, willing heart to learn and keep at it and try your best and do, I take responsibility when I married her. I, and I was trying to preach and it was just a try. I wasn't very good. I'm still not very good. But I love to try. But I, I can tell you, as you keep reading the Bible, keep studying the Bible, you make mistakes. And I've made plenty of mistakes. We all make mistakes. But I want that house in my inner man now. 
I understand that plainly, clearly. That's very important to me for a mature, mature person. So, you know, the walk and being led of the Spirit. And I just use that as a marriage part. The second one I want to look at is a need provided by the assembly. Now here we are, <coughs> we're an assembly. And we're going to use the Philippians. So go ahead and turn over there to Philippians chapter 4. And we'll look at Paul, the situation, the letter that he writes to the Philippians. We start out in Galatians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians 4. And we're going to look at verse 19. So many people want to quote this verse, but they quote it out of context too. And if you'll look in Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need. Notice the word need there. Plural or singular? It's singular. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So that, that is singular there. Or what the question would be, he's writing to the Philippians, a local assembly just like we are. And he says, but my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Well, the question would be, what would be their need? And my first thought would be, not justification, because they're already saved. You know, whenever you believe the gospel, you're justified, you're declared righteous. So it's not justification. That's not the need there in the context. They're already saved. The next question I would ask in that verse, where does God supply the riches at? Read the verse. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So where does God supply the riches at? In glory by Christ Jesus. That's where they're supplied. Now, thinking along that line, I need to understand what's in Christ Jesus. You think about that. What's in Him? Well, read the chapter of Philippians 4.13 now. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And I alert a lot of people quote that verse and they don't have a clue what it says. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's inner man's strength. That's not going out here in the circumstances and situations and saying, the Lord, He's going to pave the way and get me through it. It's not that way. But it's inner man's strength. We read Ephesians 3.16. We read Philippians 2. God works in us. I believe it's in verse 13. So you think about through Christ which strengthens me. So... Where are we getting our, our strength in? Or who are we getting in? Where are we getting our strength? In Christ Jesus. Notice that I can do all things in verse 13 through Christ which strengthens me. So what are we get, we're, we're doing? We're building up our inner man with sound doctrine with a renewed mind. That's what you're doing. We all know that the revelation of the mystery was given to Paul. We know that. We know Paul writes Romans through Philemon. That's to us. The rest of the Bible is for our learning. So we're building up that sound doctrine in our inner man, that house of doctrine in our soul, with a renewed mind. Well, reading this in Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. There's a different need here in this chapter, in the context. Well, read verse 14, Philippians 4.14. Paul says, notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Well, let me ask you, where is Paul at when he writes a letter? Prison. Affliction. He had affliction. And you notice that, that you did communicate. Well, that, that communicating there, that's, think, you think about money. You think about giving. Or whatever, we're going to look at that. There's, there's a need with my affliction. Paul's in jail. Well, look what Epaphroditus, what he says about Epaphroditus in verse 18, Philippians 4 18. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. 
So what did the Epaphras do? Epaphras do? He brought a care box to him. That's what he did. That's exactly what he brought him. So the question I would ask, who supplied Paul's need? You know, you think about verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory of Christ Jesus. Well, who supplied all Paul's need there? The people at Philippi, those believers. They're the ones who supplied the need. How does God supply all your need? Well, he supplies it to other believers in the local assembly, mature saints. That's why I can say this to you. You build up the house of doctrine in you. And when we, the more we build that doctrine up in us, the more we're going to understand how important it is that we give to, to ministries that get the gospel out, whether it's overseas, whether it's here in the United States or whatever, but we give it so they can give it out. And that, that is maturity on our part. That was maturity on those Philippians, those believers, to be able to recognize the fact that Paul's in prison, he had these needs, and we're going we're gonna to send these items by Epaphroditus to him. And that's what they did. And they, they communicated. So that's a mature, that's maturity. And uh, they were walking, and like I said, the meaning of being led of the Spirit. They were led of the Spirit because they had the doctrine in them. Paul, they recognized that Paul was their apostle. He'd given the gospel to them, and he was he had the doctrine in him, and they the, the doctrine was given to them, and they're building up that house of doctrine in them, and so, so therefore motivation comes. And that's being led of the Spirit. That, that's how it works. And there's nothing hard about it, but yet people sometimes have to try to make it hard about being led of the Spirit. But you gotta have something in your soul, right? you gotta have the word of God, the truth in you rather than divide it in your soul to be able to do that. And if you don't have that, like years back, I'll take myself, I didn't have this doctrine in me, and so therefore was I led to the Spirit? No. What was I being led by? Body, soul, and spirit. Letting the flesh lead. So you think about that. And here's the third thing about the meaning of being led to the Spirit. We think about maturity, uh, mature walk and led to the Spirit. And, and that the next one is getting along with others. And that takes maturity to get along with other people. Turn to Colossians chapter 3 and look at verse 13. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13. These are things that are not hard to understand. They're just, they're just basic <laughs> Bible principles that we can learn from. And here's the third one, getting along with others. Colossians 3.13 forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. This verse is not practiced like it should be. And I can tell you that. And you know it. There's people that will get mad with a drop of a hat, as the old saying goes. And they get mad they're done. They don't want any part of it. You're, you're wrong, I'm right. They can point their finger, but they can't look at themselves in the mirror. And they're not looking at Colossians 3.13. And how should we handle a quarrel with another brother? You know, if two people, if I get into a <clears throat> dispute with somebody, how, how do you handle that? Well, Colossians 3.13, <clears throat> notice it says, for bearing one another, forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you. That's how you do it. Even as Christ forgave you. And for, uh, notice that. And forgiving one another. You, you see that in forgiving one another? It doesn't do away with the hurt. Somebody can hurt you. Say bad things towards you. Talk about you to other people. Try to put you down. Put your ministry down. That's the way the devil does. The devil attacks the message. And then the devil attacks the messenger. And guess what? He uses believers to do that. So I'm saying, you know, when you forgive one another, that doesn't do away with the problem. It doesn't do away with the hurt. You can be hurt. I'm talking about internally hurt. 
It doesn't do away with it. What does forgiveness do? Well, we're going to attack the problem with a mature, renewed mind thinking. That's how I attack the problem. I may have a dispute with somebody, and I may be hurt, I, 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 and I may doesn't do away with the hurt and all that, but I can get a renewed mind and get strength to that house of doctrine in my inner man. So, internally, we're going to have the hurt in a renewed, mature manner. And that's grace way. That's the way grace operates. Mature manner. So, if you'll notice in Colossians 3.13, the last part of that verse says four words. So also do ye. Now notice that. That's a command right there for us. Talking about obeying the truth a while ago. Last week I told you about commands. We're not, we're not under the law. We're under grace. But we do have commands. That's the revealed will of God right there. You want to know about the revealed will of God about forgiving somebody? There it is. Colossians 3.13. And you know what? It takes maturity to handle that. Like I said, you know, it doesn't, I forgive you What if you've done me wrong. It, it doesn't do away with the problem. You may still have a problem with me. It doesn't do away with the hurt. I hurt inside. But with maturity in my inner man, I handle the problem that way. That's maturity. I don't just, I don't just, uh, just go into a shell clam up, whatever you want to call it, and walk away or ignore and all that type of stuff, but you learn to deal with the problem. Now, another one we'll look at on maturity, the word lawful. And turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. We're talking about things about a mature walk and led of the Spirit. And we all should desire to have a mature walk, have maturity, have that house of doctrine built up in our souls. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, Paul says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Now, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Paul's talking to believers. Well, how do we know that Paul's talking to believers? The verse, verse 11. And such were some of you, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now he's talking to believers when you read, when you read verse 12. And then he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 6, 12, all things are lawful unto me. Well, what's Paul talking about? He's talking about the word lawful. Now we know that we're not under the law. We know that. So, we're not under the law. We're, we're, we're under grace. And you know, you could go to Romans 6. Is it verse 14? We ought to know that. I'll, I'll flip over there right quick. You don't have to turn. Romans 6, 14. <coughs> for, for sin shall not have dominion over you if you're not under the law, but under grace. So, we're, we're not under the law. So, it's not talking about that. It's, it's talking about lawful. We're talking about a mature person now, and he understands about the lawful part here, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. We know that we're not under the law. We have rights and we have liberties under grace. But I want to give you one meaning about the lawful. One meaning, all things are lawful. One meaning is rightful. R-I-G-H-T-F-U-L. You know, we're not under the law, we're under grace. We have rights, we have liberty. But there's things that we that we want to do that's right. It's rightful, and that's what the verse is. is I think is teaching one one meaning is rightful. Well, let me ask you this: We read Colossians three sixteen about forgiving one another. Is that rightful? It most certainly is. That's an example of that. It's lawful. It's right. It's what I'm supposed to be doing. Forgiving people. Not tearing people down, edifying, building up the believers, and forgiving. So when the Word of God tells us to do something, we have to do it. Now here that leads to this question. What if we don't do what the Word of God tells us to do? 
And you know as well as I do, there's believers, and you may be sitting here that you've got something against somebody, and you, you've had it for years against that believer, and you've not forgiven them. So what if you, and the Word of God says forgive them, Colossians 3 13. So what if you don't do that? You know what it is? It's unbelief. You don't believe the Bible. You're, you're not believing what the Word of God says. You're not doing what it says. So it's unbelief. You're, it doesn't mean you're not saved, but it does mean it's unbelief. And here's another point here in verse 5, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. That word expedient. And we're, talk, we're talking about things about a mature walk and led of the Spirit. And we're talking about a mature person who knows about the lawful things. He knows about the expedient. So, notice it says all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. So, what you want to do is, well, what is expedient? And expedient is useful. Something is useful. Something that's profitable. It's good for me. That's expedient. Well, that's, that's, you know, that's what I want. I want something that's expedient. It's good for me. Uh, not expedient means it's not in my best interest. And I'll tell you this, we've all done things that's not in our best interest. And you know that. I don't have to ask you what have you already done. We wouldn't, be, we wouldn't get out of here on next week if we all start confessing what all we've done that was not in our best interest. I mean, it could go on and on. But we've done things like that. But I'm saying a mature person uh, recognizes the fact that there's things that are not expedient. Uh, it's, it's, it's not good for me. Long term, it's not good for me. I'm not going to do it. And it's, it's, it's not good for my brothers or sisters here in, in the assembly. So I'm not going to do it. I'm going to give you a good example. Let's say, I'm going to use myself. Let's just say I'm a young man, got a family, two, two children, which that's what we had, wife, I come in one day and I tell my wife, Connie, I've quit my job. Here I am, head of the house, spiritual leader of the household, should be providing for a family, quit. And I'm going to tell you, I saw people like that in Bible school. They said they were going to live by faith. And that's foolishness when you do that. And I'm going to give you an example. Look at, look at Proverbs. This is for our learning. And I want you to look at this. Proverbs 25, 19. This is a serious thing to not provide for your family. Proverbs 25, 19. So I know not expedient. It would not be expedient for me to quit my job if I was working with two children and a wife. Which I, they're all grown. The children are I'm an old man now, but back when I was younger, it wouldn't have been expedient. I'd been immature doing that. But Proverbs 25, 19, notice this. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Now that's what an unfaithful man looks like. I mean, he's got a broken tooth. That wouldn't be good. Could you imagine... I broke one of my front teeth off and uh, here I'd have a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Couldn't walk. Well, you think about a confidence and unfaithful man in time of trouble is like that. Why would you want to put confidence in an unfaithful man? Well, you know what? I looked at this verse. The word unfaithful, if, I got, if I'm right, and I think I am, it's only used one time in the Bible. Right here. Unfaithful. You look it up, make sure I'm right. One time used it in the Bible. And you know about unfaithful. That's a person that's not observant to, to promises. They make promises and never keep those promises. They're unfaithful. Uh, they're not obedient. They're not obeying what they say. They, they say, I'm going to vow to do this. And they never do it. They say... Uh, also, their duty. They're not, they're not 
following through with their duty. Like, for example, if I was using myself and I quit my job with a family, my duty was to provide for my family. I'm not following through with that. That's an unfaithful man. Violating trust or confidence. An unfaithful man will violate trust and confidence in people. When you violate something, you know what you do? You injure that person, other people. If I quit my job and I was unfaithful and I, would, I violated that trust there in my wife and my two children, and that injured them. They've got injury internally. It may not show it outside, but they're injured because of unfaithfulness. But I looked at that word again. Those are definitions. And uh, another definition that it uses about it, an infidel. Noel Webster Dictionary says unfaithful is, a, is an infidel. Do you know what an infidel is? Look here at it. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. First Timothy chapter five and verse eight. In first Timothy five eight, but if any provide not for his own, that's the example I was using a minute ago about me as a husband, younger years, so I quit my job, didn't provide for my family. So but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house. He hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. You know what an infidel is? It's an unbeliever. That's how bad it is. That's an unfaithful man. And that, that right there tells you something about men, about being unfaithful. And uh, that really struck home. I didn't quit my job. I provided for my family. I work night and day going to school. I don't feel like I quit. Uh, but I know people that have. I saw students quit when I was in Bible school and saying, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to live by faith and the Lord's going to provide for me. That's not what the Word says. If you don't work, you don't eat. That's what the Word says. So, I'm talking about maturity. You look at that there. You've got the house of doctrine uh, uh, built up in you. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and my time's running out. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and look at verse 12. First Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Notice that word power there. That's control. That's legalism. That's bondage. That's like the Galatians were in. That's what it's talking about. Go back to Galatians 5.18 and we're going to quit. Galatians 5.18 In Galatians 5.18 But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not on the law. Well, what if you're not led of the Spirit? If you're walking body, soul, and flesh. Law. That's all it is. So what does this verse tell a believer? When you read first Galatians 5, 18, you let me lay of the Spirit, you're not on the law. We're free to make decisions in life. Every one of us here. We're free to make decisions. And don't ever forget that. Well, let me give you this. Go with Romans 8, 14 again. And we go back, we read it. But Romans 8, 14, it tells you something else. We're free to make decisions in life. And looking in Romans 8, 14, it talks about for as many as are, as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You know, when you look at that verse, that's you're confident to make decisions. We're free to make them. And we've got confidence here. We're led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. We, sons of God talks about being adults, maturity, and you walk. They're already saved, so you're mature, you're confident, and you understand that God has equipped us to walk. To make, to, we're free to make the decisions. We've got confidence to make the decisions. We're going to make decisions by the Word of God putting the Word in us and the Holy Spirit teaching us. 
with a doctrine in our inner man, and we're going to make decisions based on our ability the best that we possibly can. That's mature. Do you always make the right one? You don't always, but correct it when you don't. But we're, we've got freedom to make, to make decisions. And, and, and that's something there that you've got confidence to make those decisions. And that's why I don't be afraid to make decisions. Maturity. Put the doctrine in you and you'll go ahead and make the decisions. So I'll say this, the meaning of being led of the Spirit. People have got a lot of ideas out there, but what does the Word of God say?